Hi, my name is Linji Manyozo. I'm a senior lecturer in communication for development here at RMIT University. I'm quite enthused, in fact, to have this opportunity to address you as part of this UNICEF-supported communication for development conference. I would have loved to be there with you, but because of other logistical issues, I'm not. And therefore, I'm going to share some ideas and some thoughts with regards to what I think communication for development theory and practice are all about. Writing in the 1960s, the British writer and historian Edward Palmer Thompson observed in the beautiful book, The Making of the English Working Class. I'm seeking to rescue the poor Stockinger, the Luddite Cropper, from the enormous condensation of posterity. And he observes in a few lines later that their communitarian ideals may have been fantasies, but they lived through these times of acute social disturbance, and we did not. What he's advancing, therefore, in my opinion, is not to dismiss the agency of marginalized groups, but rather to try to understand history as well as development from the perspective of the people who live through the experiences. It is my well-considered thought that to study and understand the history of communication for development, we have to look at it from the perspective of the people who were involved in initiating these concepts and some of these practices. So what is communication for development? For me, communication for development is a group or refers to a group of method-driven, theory-informed, and gender-sensitive methodologies that involve the application of media and communication tools and pathways with the aim of transforming the political economy of development. The reason I emphasize the transformation of the political economy is that no matter how much information you can provide to a particular group of people, if the fundamental causes of inequality are not uprooted or addressed, there is no way you are going to experience any change in society. Think about a woman who is living in a village whose husband has gone to the city to work. And because the husband does not get enough money or gets low salary, he's living in the city and he has left his, his wife behind and children behind as well. But whilst living in the city, he finds another woman he contracts the virus and transmit, transmits it back to the wife at home. So no matter how much information you can provide to this woman at home, whether you're going to talk about preventing or protecting herself, as long as you don't deal with this fundamental inequality, fundamental structure of inequality, which makes the husband to stay far away from the home, you're not going to change anything. So for us as practitioners, we also need to understand the context in which interventions are initiated and developed. But to do that, we need to understand a few things. And for me, these few things comprise, number one, the definitions, the various definitions of communication for development. And what are these? For Daniel Lena in the 1950s, communication and the media was all about changing the mobilities of individuals so that they can become modernized. So for some organizations, the idea of communication for development is all about modernizing individuals. The assumption being development is teleported from other parts of the world, is teleported from outside the communities. And that's what Lena was all about. And that's what he wrote about in his book, The Passing of Traditional Society. And then there is Nora Kebro, who writes about the art and science of human communication applied to the speedy transformation of society. For, for Nora, development entailed being artistic. What are we talking about when we say the art? The art is the ability to be creative with our approaches, to be innovative. We don't need to stick to traditions in terms of doing things. But the science is much more problematic for a lot of organizations because science does not just refer to reading certain books, theories, and knowledge. Rather, science is one way of explaining the world. It's an objective way of explaining the world. So when Nora Kebro talks about being scientific, 
He wants us to be able to be in a position where we are able to explain what we are doing. We have to be evidence-driven, evidence-informed. And indeed, for a lot of organizations, we are informed by theory. We are driven by evidence in our work. Even if the approaches themselves are somewhat some, uh, circumspect. The other definition I want you to think about uh, in terms of communication for development comes from Paulo Freire. But Paulo Freire, I have to mention, was not a communication scholar. Even though we have tried to apply his thoughts and ideas in communication for development. When he initially started his ideas in the 1950s in Brazil, he was more concerned with the kind of education that was offered, especially to marginalized classes. His idea, or he, rather his ideas, were more concerned, I think, with trying to make education work for the poor, but to work in such a way that it could also transform their lives, such that the structure, the form, and the format of education itself, including the content of education, had to be built on the needs, the information needs, and the realities of the people who were uh, uh, involved in this education. This is where the notion of critical pedagogy comes from. The very idea that men and women are rational enough and they should contribute to the making of history. Now, why should we mention Paulo Freire many, many years later in this uh, part of Africa? There are a number of ideas from Freire that I think are very fundamental. The first one concerns naming. Paulo Freire describes naming as the ability to define a problem. Now, this is really important because many, many cases, there are many, many cases of communication for development where organizations go into communities and they define problems for these communities. We never give the opportunity for communities to define these problems. The idea of naming is not just attaching a name. Naming is symbolic. It refers to sitting down, doing a critical analysis of a problem, being able to look at this problem from different perspectives, and be able to come up with collective solutions that address this particular problem. In the process of doing this, we ensure that we don't leave anybody behind, whether because of sexuality, because of gender, because of class, we make sure that everybody is on board. And this was the whole, the, the, the whole basis for coming up with prevention, combination prevention in HIV prevention, to make sure that nobody is left behind from key population groups to the most marginalized living at the periphery of the periphery. So the politics of naming from Freire refers to the ability to bring everybody on board to contribute to the definition of a problem. After all, Freire as a Marxist or a post-Marxist believes in the making and, and making of history by men and women who are involved in that uh, historical experience. The second aspect of Freire that I think is important, in my opinion, is the notion of tolerance, which I define as the notion of listening in my work. Listening does not necessarily refer to keeping quiet when somebody is speaking. Rather, it refers to the spirit of communion. In Latin, it's communicare. This is spirit of communion, embracing other human beings, even if we fundamentally agree with their ideas and their personalities, as well as cultures. The idea that other people may be right, even when we strongly feel that our points deserve validity, especially in the context of development. So to listen to other people also entails that we listen to ourselves. Because as practitioners, sometimes we are so enslaved to all these ideas we have learned over the years, to an extent we feel threatened when we experience or we come into contact with new ideas. So listening entails being able to adapt, being able to listen to new ideas, but being able to feel comfortable, especially when it comes to learning new things. As Paulo Freire says, to learn to do things with different people in different contexts. Another issue that comes from Freire that I think is also very important is the issue of our own behavior as practitioners of C4D. It's an area that we rarely pay attention to. But if really, think about it. If really we care about equality, if we care about gender, if we care about empowerment, if we care about empowerment and we care about the community, can we be racist? Can we discriminate people based on their sexuality, based on their gender, based on their class? 
What kind of people are we supposed to be as communication for development practitioners? I don't consider myself an expert, actually. I consider myself a student because there are so many challenges in the field that every time I'm out doing something, I feel I'm also back in the classroom learning new things at every opportunity. We have to be able to open our mind, to be humble, to be empathetic, to celebrate different experiences with different people in order to become better C4D practitioners. In Malawi and of course the region, we have had excellent examples of communication for development. From the 1970s in the country, Chris Kamlongera, David Kerr and Mopa Shumba, they were able to use theatre for development as a platform, as a pathway for mobilizing communities to support the development initiatives that were being propounded, that were being introduced and implemented by the government of the day, that was the Malawi Congress Party. So the idea here was that development that had been concocted, that had been implemented by policymakers, would need the support of communities long after these interventions had been implemented. So we see the existence of modernistic thinking in Malawi and the region as well. And this kind of modernistic, modernistic thinking has not stopped, it has not ended. In fact, even in terms of interventions today, we find so many organizations that are implementing development along the same modernistic lines, along the same lines of modernity. The idea that it is organizations, it is the government that knows better. It is the government that can bring development from outside the communities. Over the years, we have seen the emergence of organizations like Pakachere, Krekom, which have also developed this notion of communication for development further. The Development Broadcasting Unit at the Malawi Broadcasting Corporation has expanded and expounded on this notion as well with radio listening clubs, with communities now being involved in the production of content that affects their own lives and using this content to engage with uh, uh, service providers. We have had so many examples from the Agriculture Communications Unit in the Ministry of Agriculture and within the region Excellent example comes from South Africa, the Soul City uh, model, which is, takes on a multimedia approach and engages people on the ground. So it's not just radio content or television content, rather it's the ability of subject matter specialists and communities to conduct engagement on the ground based on that content. So the content becomes an initiator of the engagement process, i.e. we can say that the content is a key fundamental building block of engagement, community engagement, as well as communication. It is therefore for this reason that in my book, Media, Communication and Development, I have propounded three approaches because there is no one way. There is no way one can put a finger and say, this is communication for development. I look at development communication or communication for development from three approaches or perspectives. The first one is media development. When I'm talking about media development, I'm talking about structure, the ability to install a radio station, a television station, to start a blog, to start a website, the ability to initiate that media structure. That's what media development is about. But for that media structure to operate properly, you need relevant and enabling legislation. You need good policies. So it's also about enacting and mobilizing and lobbying for good policies as well. But at the same time, it's also about building the capacity of the people to work in those media structures. So the first approach, media development, is all about structure, about capacity and policy as well. The second approach is media for development. Media for development is about content, subject matter specialists, working with communities or target members, targeted members of the community to generate content that is going to motivate people to change their behavior. And that's what social and behavior change is about. And I want to emphasize on this point because oftentimes there has been an equation equating communication for development with social and behavior change communications. These are totally different. In fact, social and behavior change communications is just a small component of communication for development. So communication for Development has three approaches, as I said, media development, media for development, 
which is almost similar to social and behavior change communications, and it's about changing behaviors. And then the third one is participatory communication, which is about the process of communication. In fact, the Latin word communication is communicare. It's not just to communicate, it's to celebrate. It's like sharing spirit between individuals. You are sharing something deeper than just a conversation. It's where you're able to sit down and listen to each other, engage with each other. There is an Aboriginal word that I don't know how to pronounce, but it refers to communication as finding each other, finding something in somebody's heart that resonates with your own. Even when you are disagreeing fundamental about certain things, there is always something you agree on. And participatory communication is about finding that balance, finding those opportunities and liminal spaces where we agree with each other. And using that as a basis for developing, for generating interventions and being able to implement them together. So having talked about these three approaches, what is the future of communication for development in Malawi, in the region and globally? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities that exist out there for us as practitioners? I think I would go back to Freire again because Freire helped us to think deeply about key issues in development and of course development communication. Even, even, I must mention, even if Freire himself was not a communication scholar and he admitted to that in the book, We Make the Road by Walking. So what are these issues that I would like us to think about? Number one is business thinking, the issue of evidence. Business thinking is a very strategic way of looking at the various available programming opportunities and saying which is the most cost effective. So I'm not talking about something that is cheap here. I'm talking about something that is going to yield you long-term results, good results in the long term. So an intervention might seem expensive today, but in the long term, it is a wise investment. For example, sending girls to school might seem expensive today to build new schools, to put in new teachers, to find the exercise books. Everything might seem expensive today. But over time, you find that girls are not getting pregnant at a young age. They're getting married at a late age, late age in the 20s, in the 30s. And as a result, they don't put pressure on the health system in the country. So a wise investment is measured by the long-term results that it is able to yield for us not the amount of money that we have to invest in it. But this poses its own challenge because we have to understand the unit cost of an intervention. In HIV prevention, a unit cost of voluntary counseling and testing, to be able to go in a center where you are able to test for HIV is $10 per person. Now we're able to do that, it's a bio biomedical intervention. But what is the unit cost of a radio program to take a person into that center. How can we calculate that unit cost? And you find that for a lot of communication interventions, we don't have a way of calculating this. The models, the spectrum models that are employed to calculate, to, 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 to think about scenario planning, to even calculate uh, uh, the unit cost, have not done any wonders, has not, have not done any us. Uh, has not, have not done us any favors with regards to communication interventions. To such an extent, it's hard, it's almost impossible to know the unit cost of most communication intervention. So number one is evidence. It's about business thinking. Number two, which I think is important, is about learning. Now when I'm talking about learning, I'm not talking about you know, reading new things from books. It's about being open-minded, to be able to accept criticism. There is a tendency I've observed in the field of communication for development for practitioners to hold on to, to cling to ideas even if they are not working, largely because they learned them in a workshop in America or they learned them in a workshop in Canada. And they think about the traveling, the air ticket, the food they ate in a hotel, and they think they, whatever they learned there was so valuable because they spent a lot of money. They traveled a long distance to learn these things. Yet when we are faced with realities in the communities, we realize our knowledge is futile, it's useless. 
we should be able to open up our minds to learning new things with different people. And sometimes the people that teach us the most important lessons are not educated people. They are the people that we work with in communities. And that's what learning is all about. It's using all opportunities to understand new things, to appreciate that we're not the only ones who know things, that other people too can contribute creative and very fundamental issues to the debates on communication for development. Another important issue that I would like us to think about critically is the issue of our own behavior as communication for development practitioners. If I am claiming to be a communication for development practitioner, what does it entail? Can I be racist at the same time? Can I be somebody who looks down upon other people because they are of a different gender, of a different sexuality? Or they have a, a, a different level of education? Is that what communication for development practice is about? I think communication for development practice is about empathy. It is about celebrating people, celebrating individuality, celebrating the multiplicity of cultures, celebrating doing different things with different people at the same time, or using all these opportunities to learn new things with different people. It doesn't matter where they come from. It doesn't matter the color of their skin. So I think the behavior is really fundamental because it is a testament to what is in our heart. It is a testament to the humility or to the arrogance in our heart. We need to be humble. We need to be able to sit with people on the floor to be able to say, look, we want to listen to you. Can you teach us new things about this, uh, this problem that we see at hand? The other issue I think that I want to mention before I finish my presentation is the issue of naming. Now, when there is a new baby in our communities, we give this baby a new name, a name. To name a baby, most of the time, it, it gives it definition. It gives this baby definition. It gives the baby color. Now, when I'm talking about naming from the perspective of Paulo Freire, I'm talking about the ability to define a problem, not just to give it a name. If girls are not going to school, most of them are getting married, they are dropping out of school. What is the name of this problem? I'm not talking about just describing the problem. Why is the problem there? If there are certain people who don't want to be consulted on a particular issue, why don't they want to be consulted? So when I'm talking about naming, I'm talking about understanding the structural inequalities in which our problems are embedded. So if you have rising rates of new infections in terms of HIV, don't just blame individuals, don't just blame sexualities or gender. Be able to understand why there are new infections in the first place. There is a tendency, for example, by a lot of organizations, especially Western organizations, to say we want to change behavior because culture is contributing to the spread of HIV. Well, not so fast, because my experience shows that a lot of people that are contracting the virus are people like me, people with education, people with disposable income, people who are least likely to practice those traditional customs. So these traditions are not the cause, are not the main cause of new infections. If you look at the know your epidemic studies, in fact, what it shows, I think in my opinion, is that we, be, we need to begin to change the paradigm, to begin to raise questions about how we think and do development. Think about people who talk about the culture of silence, that a lot of people, especially in the villages, you know, they practice cultures of silence, they don't talk about sex. Yet studies, ethnographic studies, and our own experiences in the villages show that people are talking about sex all the time. When women are pounding, they are talking about sex. When men are hunting, they're working in the garden, they're talking about sex. Kids in school, they're talking about sex. In fact, kids in school are producing pornography using cell phones and sharing it on their mobile phones. So the very idea, the very thought that communities, our communities, our communities in Africa, are, you know, are communities that demonstrate cultures of silence is fundamentally flawed. So from the perspective of Paulo Freire, we need to question these dominant ideas that are spoken as Bible truth within organizations, because they are not true. And the consequence 
of not naming our problems properly is that we end up with interventions that are not realistic. So I want to wish you a great time in your discussions and hopefully the resolutions that you come up with are going to contribute to sustainable, deep and long-term conversations about the role of communication and social change in Malawi. Thank you very much.